The Overlook theory concerning Adolf Hitler and his remains is a simple yet contentious one. Perhaps the reason why, despite the best efforts of Schmersch and NKVD to alter the medical evidence, the bodies of the burned man and woman found in the Reich Chancery Garden in early May 1945 don't really fit is because they are not Adolf Hitler and his wife. That leaves only two possibilities. The first one is that Hitler escaped. I've always thought this to be the most preposterous theory out there for a multitude of reasons. Here are some of them. 1. Hitler's health was very bad by April 1945, and he could barely climb the bunker stairs, let alone go gallivanting across the world by plane, U-boat and donkey cart to some South American bolt hole. 2. Hitler talked constantly of killing himself if he was defeated. He said this multiple times to multiple witnesses, and also discussed in some detail how to do it. 3. If he did escape, who was the man who died in the bunker? A man who was still holding military situation conferences and issuing orders to the last. Orders obeyed by all his subordinates, including visiting army generals and senior Waffen-SS officers. Conspiracy theorists would have us believe that Hitler was substituted for a double. There is no firm evidence, I repeat, no firm evidence that Hitler used doubles, only post-war supposition. Hitler Youth leader Arta Axmann, who spoke at length to Hitler in the bunker the day before he died, had this to say in a 1948 interrogation about doubles and whether Hitler was really dead. Quote, nonsense of that sort is simply incomprehensible to me. How can people conceive such nonsense? For one thing, there is no double who would allow himself to be killed for somebody else. Then I was together with Hitler on the previous night and saw him alive in his usual self. And then I saw him dead, and remembering all the details, I can say that was Hitler. Then, thirdly, it was my firm impression that Hitler had made up his mind not to survive defeat. And above all, if Hitler should be alive anywhere at all, we may rest assured that Goebbels would be there with him, and after all Goebbels' corpse has been identified. So therefore, I don't believe that Goebbels would kill himself and his wife and five little children if he knew Hitler was going to remain alive. End quote. You might consider Axman's comments and indeed the testimony of all the surviving bunker personnel as lies. And that's your right. Perhaps they were made up to cover the traces of their dear leader safe in Argentina. Well, think about it. If Hitler escaped, he did so without one single member of his inner staff. He left them all behind. His valet, his adjutants, his doctors, his dentists, his secretaries, his entire bodyguard unit, everyone. They are all accounted for post-war, with the exception of two people. Martin Bormann, which is a case of itself, and he certainly was in the bunker after Hitler was dead, and the head of the Gestapo, who has never been accounted for, but it must be pointed out was not really a member of the inner circle. He simply visited the bunker on several occasions because of his high position. So, if the Hitler escape theory is to be believed, Bormann must also have been a double, because he must have buggered off with Hitler earlier on. Perhaps some of the others in the bunker were also doubles. So was only Goebbels now real, and the rest of the senior management doubles. And what of Hitler's loyal subordinates? How did they feel, left to care for a double, and abandoned to the tender mercies of the Soviets? None of it makes any sense if looked at from the available evidence. It is too complex a conspiracy to have succeeded, particularly as by the time Hitler announced that he would die, the only way out of encircled Berlin was on foot. All the available planes then having departed, or have been destroyed, and the airfields overrun, or, as with the emergency landing strip in the Tiergarten under heavy artillery fire. Another telling piece of evidence for how stupid this theory actually is, is the fact that both Hitler's personal pilot, SS General Hans Bauer, and his deputy pilot, SS Colonel Bates, were both in the bunker with Hitler to the end. 
I could go on, but I'm unlikely to convince those who are firmly wedded to the Hitler escape myth promulgated by many poor quality documentaries and badly researched books, and based largely on FBI documents released under Freedom of Information Acts, the FBI after the war being duty-bound to investigate every possible sighting of Hitler, no matter how ludicrous. And also, I think, by the Soviets, who deliberately muddied the waters for a long time after the war, Returning to Earth and what actually occurred, the clues to finding the truth about the bodies lie with both of the bodies themselves and the witness testimonies. If we accept the data from the Soviet autopsies of the burned bodies from the Reich Chancellery Garden as being accurate, many, many difficulties are posed. I am inclined to believe the Soviet pathologists for the simple reason that they constantly reported medical evidence that conflicted directly with the accepted story of the deaths of Hitler and Eva Braun that were emerging from German witnesses captured and interrogated by the NKVD. The fact that the Soviet Medical Commission's final report completely ignores any evidence that challenges this story is proof enough that the doctors told the truth, but the final report was a political document worked on by non-medical NKVD officers for political reasons. The body of the woman cannot have been Ava Brown's for several provable reasons. 1. The medical evidence shows that the woman died from shrapnel injuries to the chest and heart. These injuries could only have occurred during life. No witness to Brown's death has ever reported her being mortally wounded by artillery fire. 2. The gold bridge work found loose in the corpse's mouth was certainly Ava Brown's, but consistent witness testimonies demonstrate that this bridge work was never fitted to Brown while she was alive. 3. No cyanide residue was discovered in the internal organs of the corpse, only in the corpse's mouth, indicating the woman had already died when the poison was introduced to her mouth. All witness testimonies claim that Ava Brown took poison in the bunker to end her life. You can argue these points as much as you like, but the medical evidence is clear. The body identified as Ava Brown was not Ava Brown. Other clues on the body indicate the suspicious removal of teeth, the raging dental caries in the remaining teeth, and the height discrepancy. The male corpse, based on the medical and witness testimonies, could be Hitler's, but there are problems with its identification. 1. No evidence of a cause of death could be established by the Soviets. There was no evidence of a gunshot through the right or left temple or through the roof of the mouth, even though the Soviets looked extremely hard. There was also no evidence the kind of gunshot described by many of the witnesses in the bunker, even though the Soviets tested the area around the sofa and the sofa itself for blood. 2. The body is too short, and the left foot had probably been surgically amputated. 3. No cyanide compounds were found in the internal organs, only in the mouth. Again, the man was already dead, when someone crushed a cyanide ampule in the mouth. 4. Hitler's real dental bridge work was indeed found in the corpse's mouth. The Soviets say it was still attached to the upper and lower jaws. If true, this corpse is almost certainly Hitler's. However, Hitler's dental assistant and dental technician said that they were shown the bridge work loose, that is, not attached to any bone, indicating that the bridges could have been placed loose in the corpse's mouth to aid the correct identification of the corpses by the Soviet discoverers. The NKVD's second investigation concluded that the burned bodies showed evidence of forensic fraud perpetrated by the Germans, which leads us to the forgotten and overlooked theory. Perhaps the Soviets never found Hitler's body. Why? Because the loyal SS were determined that they never would. Hitler had given very specific orders that the bodies of himself and his wife must be destroyed after death. The generally accepted view is that following death, and regarding how death occurred, the witness testimonies are all over the place, and we'll probably never know. The two bodies were carried up the bunker's emergency exit staircase and laid in a shallow crater near the exit and burned, using jerry cans of petrol from the Reich Chancellery garage. 
The cremation lasted, again according to multiple witnesses, from around 4.30 in the afternoon to about 7pm in the evening, as guards added further jerry cans of fuel intermittently to the bodies. Sometime after 7pm, SS General Johann Rattenhuber, the head of Hitler's bodyguard unit, and some of his men buried the bodies in the pit. However, we know from multiple testimonies that the open-air petrol fire on sandy soil was very inefficient and did not completely destroy the bodies. We have the evidence of two low-ranking SS guards who were on duty around the Reich Chancellery site and who witnessed the burning of the bodies, corroborating the testimony of Hitler's valet, Heinz Linger, the SS adjutant, Günther, the chief driver, Erich Kempke, and other senior bunker personnel who testified both to the Soviets or to the Americans and British, and they had burned the bodies as described. Erich Mansfeld, one SS guard, watched the funeral from a distance and testified to British intelligence officer Major Hugh Trevor Roper. Quote, First, there were two SS officers carrying a body wrapped in a blanket, with black trousered legs protruding from it. Then there was another SS officer carrying the unmistakable corpse of Eva Braun. End quote. SS guard Hermann Karnau went over to the burning pit soon after the others had gone back inside the bunker. He reported, quote, They were easily recognizable, though Hitler's head was smashed. The sight was repulsive in the extreme. End quote. Trevor Roper never believed that the bunker personnel managed to completely cremate the corpses. Quote, Linger afterwards told one of the secretaries that they had burned as Hitler had ordered till nothing remained, but it is doubtful whether such total combustion would have taken place. 180 litres of petrol burning slowly on a sandy bed would char the flesh and dissipate the moisture of the bodies, leaving only an unrecognisable and fragile remainder. But the bones would withstand the heat. These bones have never been found. End quote. Which brings me to a possible theory. The loyal SS retainers most certainly did cremate the bodies as ordered, but they were buried somewhere else. The bodies the Soviets found were substituted for the real corpses, to ensure the Soviets stopped looking for Hitler's real body to put it on display in Moscow, as he feared. This theory isn't as far-fetched as it sounds. Firstly, the bunker personnel actually had plenty of time to pull off such a switch. The amount of time between the beginning of the cremation of Hitler and Ava Brown's real bodies, around 4.30pm on the 30th of April 1945, and the eventual arrival of the first Red Army units of the Führer bunker, gave the bunker residents around 31 hours to deal with this problem. As Arta Axman pointed out at his interrogation in 1948, quote, You can do a lot in 31 hours. End quote. Sometime in the evening of the 30th of April, it was realized that the cremation fire wasn't hot or concentrated enough to completely destroy Hitler and Ava Brown's bodies. Therefore, I surmise, the remains were removed from the pit and buried. But contrary to what history tells us, they were not interred in the pit where they had been burned. Instead, they were buried some distance away. Which brings me to the bodies found burned in the pit by the Soviets. Central Berlin was a raging battlefield, strewn with corpses, military and civilian. There were also several hospitals and casualty stations operating in bunkers and basements close by, including the Reich Chancellery cellars adjacent to the Führer bunker. These were overflowing with wounded, and hundreds of dead bodies were piled up outside in order to free up space and for sanitary reasons. The SS wouldn't have had to have searched hard to find the corpse of a young woman aged around 30 to 40 and the corpse of an older man of around Hitler's age. Exact height and age was immaterial. These two corpses would, after all, be burned beyond recognition and buried in the hole that everyone already knew was the pit where the real Hitler and Ava Brown had been burned. But in their haste, the SS made mistakes that the resulting fire didn't sufficiently destroy. For example, the woman had been killed by artillery fire, and the cremation didn't fully disguise this fact. The man must have died of a wound after having his left foot amputated. Again, fire failed to completely eradicate the evidence of surgery. The SS knew that the teeth would be used to identify Hitler and his wife, and so they were hurriedly pulled out. 
evidence of recent tooth extraction later found by Soviet pathologists. They also overlooked the dental caries in the woman's mouth. In both cases, the corpses were burned for a while, and then the mouths prized open, and the real dental bridges from the real Hitler corpse, and from the Reich Chancellery Dental Office safe containing Ava Brown's unused dental bridges dropped into the badly damaged mouths. Hence the gold bridge work in both corpses was not fire damaged or melted, and the false teeth enamel was still white, which I find a bit hard to believe if they had been supposedly burned for several hours. And lastly, of course, evidence had to be planted of suicide by cyanide. So someone using forceps crushed a cyanide ampule in the mouths of each body. And hey presto, there you have it. These badly burned and unrecognisable corpses were then lightly buried and left for the bumbling Soviets to discover in the days to come. So what happened to the real bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun? The answer may lie with Hitler's faithful valet, SS Obersturmbannführer Heinz Linger. Held for ten years by the Soviets and interrogated brutally by them, he always struck the NKVD as the most suspicious of Hitler's entourage that they had captured. His answers to questions about Hitler's death and the disposal of the Führer's remains were vague and often changed, even though he was absolutely central to Hitler's last hours and the treatment of his body after death. The Soviets, in fact, thought that Linger had shot Hitler, possibly on Martin Bormann's order, and that he was covering up the manner of Hitler's death. After he was released and moved to West Germany, Linger immediately changed his story again, claiming that the Soviets had never found Hitler's body, as seen in this interview. Where do you think, Herr Linger, Hitler's body is now? Buried in the uh, park of the Tantrui. Yeah. The Russians have never found Hitler's body. I know that because uh, he, uh, they never, they questioned me repeatedly about it. You think it's still there? Yes, buried in a common grave. Could it have been the case that in the 31 hours between Hitler's cremation and the Soviets capturing the Führer bunker, a handful of the most inner staff of Hitler's very loyal bodyguard had carried out a poorly thought out and hasty forensic fraud in the hopes of preventing their dread enemies, the Soviets, from getting their hands on the man they had followed so loyally for decades? I think this theory, and it is after all only a theory, is certainly easier to conceive of than the escape to South America. Such a plot indeed involves no aircraft, no U-boats, no doubles, and no elaborate code of silence among the participants after the war. How difficult was it to find two bodies that roughly match the descriptions of Hitler and Brown from among the hundreds of corpses only a stone's throw from the Führer bunker? How difficult would it have been, in the chaos surrounding the bunker, to have cremated the real bodies for a couple of hours, then substituted them for these corpses that had been forensically dressed up to appear to be Hitler and Ava Brown? How many people from the bunker actually went outside into the garden? Very few, only a tiny handful were at Hitler's actual funeral, and only for a couple of minutes before Soviet shell fire forced them back inside, there was the occasional guard sent up in the intervening hours to pour another jerry can of petrol into the pit, and there was General Rattenhuber and some of his men who allegedly went up to bury the corpses around 7pm. Nobody else went up there, it was too dangerous. In fact, most people down in the bunker were worrying about their survival. Bormann, Goebbels and the others were at that point trying to negotiate a ceasefire with the Soviets, and after that failed, they began the organisation of a breakout from the bunker on the night of the 1st to 2nd of May 1945. We don't know exactly what General Rattenhuber and some of his men were up to every minute during those intervening 30 hours. We only know what the major players were up to, because they were seen by multiple witnesses and they were discussing the great affairs of state and what they planned to do. I think a few trusted SS bodyguards under General Rattenhuber's command could have done what was needed. The actual forensic fraud would only involve knocking out some teeth, dropping in some real dental bridges, and crushing cyanide ampules into corpses that you'd already burn for a little while. To add authenticity, the bodies of Hitler's dog Blondie and Ava Brown's black dog, unburned, were buried next to the fake Hitler and Ava Brown corpses to help convince Soviet investigators that indeed they had found Hitler. 
However, don't take my word for it. The NKVD indeed came to the firm conclusion that the bodies that they found in the Chancellery Garden were ringers, forensic plants. However, this information they kept from the West. More recent DNA testing of a piece of skull with a bullet hole, also found in the hole in 1946, has proved to have absolutely no connection to Hitler, and it's interesting that the Russians now refuse to allow DNA testing of what they claim to be Hitler's jawbone. Why? Because regardless of what they told the West in the 1960s, even today, they probably fear that they never found the real Hitler, which is what Stalin actually believed to his dying day. So perhaps Hitler and Eva Brown's bodies were dumped in a communal grave near the Reich Chancellery. The Russians have never found Hitler's body. I know that because uh, he, uh, they never they questioned me repeatedly about it. You think it's still there? Yes, buried in a common grave. With Arta Axman first carrying off a quantity of Hitler's ashes from the first cremation site, as I outlined in a previous video. This relic of the physical Hitler later reburied by Axman secretly in the grave of a well known Nazi in Germany. This may mean that Hitler's bones may still exist buried somewhere in central Berlin, in one of the mass graves from the battle in 1945. Unfortunately, Heinz Linger never publicly said where exactly Hitler was buried, but you can bet your bottom dollar that it wouldn't have been far from the bunker. It was simply too dangerous for people to move around for too long in between barrages. Now, of course, a very easy way to settle all of this is for the Russians to simply compare the DNA from the burned bodies that they had in their possession with the known DNA of Hitler and Eva Braun. But this can't be done, because in 1970, less than two years after the Soviet autopsy findings were first published in the West, and as difficult questions began to be asked, Yuri Andropov, head of the KGB, the inheritor of the NKVD, ordered the bodies exhumed from an unmarked grave under the rubbish bins at the rear of KGB headquarters in Magdeburg, East Germany, and incinerated. The ashes were then tossed into the Biederitz River. You might think the KGB had something to hide, to have suddenly conducted such a curious operation, but in the words of Francis Urquhart from House of Cards, you might very well think that, but I can't possibly comment. And there you have it. We will never know what became of the bodies of Hitler and his wife. The forensic data and the witness statements are conflicting, contradictory, confusing and riddled with inconsistencies. The physical evidence, or most of it, has been destroyed. It is no exaggeration to call this the world's greatest cold case. My little theory is just one of many, and it is neither provable nor disprovable based on the available evidence. The only people who knew the precise truth are all now lying in their graves, and if there were secrets or a conspiracy surrounding Hitler's death, those secrets went with their owners into the cold earth, where they lie today never to be heard. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.